of a webinar series that I dreamed up. Um, I do have a therapist and so less pressure on you, but I also really like to start off each year uh, with the, the idea that I can help people understand new ways of looking at diversity related topics. Um, so I put together this whole concert tour um, people can still register. You can come to as many as you want. You can come to as few as you want. Doesn't matter. Sounds great to me. And um, at the end, everyone is going to get the recordings. So I wanted to make sure that today, just in case, because there's 12 different programs today, we're going to be doing a program that I call the starting place. What a beautiful place to start. And I'll talk a little bit about why I created this program um, I also want to encourage you uh, to stay in touch. Um, I'm supposed to be encouraging people to follow me on Instagram, which in case you're interested is not a venereal disease. Who knew? It's like a whole social platform that you're supposed to have friends on. So you can use this fancy schmancy QR code and follow me on Instagram. And when you're there, you can also download this draft of case studies that I'm working on with my new book. But I am burying the lead and we'll talk about those details in just a second. Um, all of my workshops are interactive and I find that there's multiple ways of being interactive, especially in a virtual thing. So there will be times where I specifically ask, does anybody have any questions, comments, answers? You can unmute and talk out loud. You can put them in the chat. There will be times where I say you should put something in the chat. If you are multitasking, please do not do that if you're uh, driving or on a treadmill. I find both of those choices to be very dangerous and I am a safety first kind of person. If you are sitting in a chair, relatively focusing, I will also tell you when you need to take screenshots or when you should try to get back to this screen. Um, but I also have a texting number because my job is to be thought provoking. And if I am thought provoking, then you're going to have thoughts later on, like while you're stirring your sauce or something. So take down the texting number 202-670-4262. You can text message me anytime you want with any kind of questions or thoughts or something. I'm happy to try to be of assistance or find something that can. If you are texting during this live webinar, the only ask that I have is that if you do not want me to read that text aloud for whatever reason, then I'm going to ask you to put DR at the beginning of the text. And I will not read the text aloud, but I will still respond to you. DR means don't read. I will read it, just not aloud. Do not put DR at the end of the text because that has led to some very awkward moments. So feel free, 202-670-4262. Emily, thank you for putting it in the chat. And um, I think we're about ready to go. Um, this particular webinar is called Diversity and Social Justice because I'm an academic nerd. I have learning outcomes for it. But like I said, what I realized was, especially when unconscious bias, which is tomorrow's webinar, when the term became kind of the trendy thing to ask for, uh, my participants started showing up with their unconscious bias to an unconscious bias workshop. And so I had to kind of back up. So I created the starting place as the null set program. So today we are doing program zero before program one tomorrow, if that's how you need to think about it. Because a lot of people haven't done the self-reflection needed to begin to have a conversation about unconscious bias. So I like to kind of start at the very beginning. So if you're interested, I will also attach something in a second or send out an email to everyone later today, more likely with some information about all the different courses and their descriptions, but some people need to know this information. And before I forget, uh, the idea of this whole webinar series is also supporting Crazy Horse Memorial. There'll be information at the end about it as well. So to get started, one of the things that I think is the most common pattern when I get asked to come into clients and they are already having contentious conversations and things are going on and their, things aren't going well, is I ask people to slow down and define their sense of responsibility. So I want you to just take a second, you don't have to say it out loud or anything like that, but I just want you to think about who do you feel responsible for? So when I ask this question, what ends up happening is often people are like, well, there's only like one answer, but there's not. There's bazillions of different interpretations of who you feel responsible for. So before we engage in a conversation about diversity and social justice, I think you need to know what's your scope of responsibility. 
So for example, my Muslim friend informed me that in her interpretation or how she does responsibility is that she is responsible for the 40 houses surrounding hers. If you're the 41st house, ha ha, I'm not in charge of you, but my neighbor is because that's how circles work, right? So do you feel responsible for the 40 houses? Do you feel perhaps you're familiar with the idea of like seven generations out or seven generations back? Some people feel responsible for their nuclear family. And at minimum, hopefully you at least feel responsible for yourself. Spoiler alert, that's where most of our work needs to go because we're not even paying attention to ourselves. So we can have this like external definition, but we don't actually even take full responsibility for ourselves all of the time. And I'm not, I don't think that that's even 100% possible, but it's certainly nice to have a goal. So Think for a second, who do you feel responsible for? And then just know that that's who you feel responsible for. So no judgment, just you need to know this kind of general information. Once you know that, then we can get to agency. So I always like to share with people that uh, when we start talking about agency, I have never been pregnant to my knowledge, and I certainly am not a parent. So those of you that have done either or both of those things, I just want to mention that is a bravery level that I have not reached. However, I do think with my parent friends that the concept of agency comes up a lot when we start talking about parenting and children. So for example, when you are a parent, you're, at what point do your kids have their own sense of agency? And at what point does your sense of agency begin to change because you have children? And what I mean by agency is kind of like the ability to do the things that you would want to do inside of the scope of responsibility. This is a really important starting place if we're going to eventually have these contentious, potentially diversity, social justice conversations, is where does your line of responsibility end? And at what point do you feel you do have agency? Have you experienced feeling like your agency has been taken away from you? I know that when COVID first happened, a very good friend of mine who's originally from the Bay Area now lives in upstate New York um, is a nurse. And her parents in the Bay Area were very, very worried about their child, who is a grown adult, do doing first responder work um, in a hospital in the early days of COVID. I also know that my friend who was the nurse was very, very worried about her elderly parents in the Bay Area being isolated. So whose responsibility kind of trumps the other ones? And at what point does the agency of parent and child begin to change? So I just use it as an example. And I want you to think about your definition of responsibility and where or how you use or do not use have given or have had it taken away your ability to do something. That is the kind of mindset that you're going to need to kind of move into what we're talking about on this particular webinar. Now, for the starting place, there is going to be something that I'm going to suggest that you use pen and paper. So you might want to also get some pen and paper if you don't have some. I'm pretty old school, so I don't think like iPads can do this, but maybe they can. I just don't know how an iPad works, but I would shoot for pen and paper. Um, once you have a grounding of what responsibility and agency is, now I want to walk through some of the buzzwords that come up when we start talking about diversity and social justice in a way that's not just educational. You need to learn what these words mean, but why do these words happen and what do they mean to you? That way we're kind of equalizing the playing field of whoever it is we're talking to. Some people who are on this call, because I looked at the registration list, you should be teaching this webinar, not taking this webinar. So I'm trying very hard not to be intimidated that there's so many experts in the audience. Some of you are here because you got sent here. I have been people's sanctions before. I want us to think about, if you think you know everything, perhaps this is helpful to talk to people who don't know everything. And if you feel like you don't know anything, you probably know more than you're giving yourself credit for, but perhaps this will be a structure that'll kind of help you think about and reflect on where you're at. I am a firm believer that we all have the ability to learn and it starts with our responsibility and agency. So let's pretend we've done that. 
The first word that I think we need to talk about is a fancy schmancy academic word, ethnocentrism. If you play Scrabble, it's worth a lot of points. And basically what this means is, is that your perspective is at the center and you think everybody else is, has the same center. That's basically what it means is you assume everybody is operating from the same center place that you are when most of us don't even actually realize that we have centered our kind of way of doing this. So I'm a nerd and I like maps. So I like to use this particular image because it is not a typical world map because we're centering the North Pole instead of centering North America for those of us that live in North America. And that's what I mean by what's at the center of kind of where we're holding our perspective. So if we do understand that the perspectives could change, this is a piece of art from my friend Dred Scott, where the center is not what we're expecting. So imagine a world without America. Even that is controversial because South America is also an America, right? And of course, Florida is still sticking its nose in things. But when we think of maps and what we put in the middle or what we don't put in the middle, it's a really important thing to understand that that's skewing something that's already skewed. So a two-dimensional map, oh, this might be controversial. Maybe I have to warn you. But a two-dimensional map of a round object, I believe the Earth is round. A round object is already going to be skewed, moving a three-dimensional object into a two-dimensional object. And because I grew up in Texas, one of the biggest map making companies is in Texas. So when the maps focus on the North America, Texas is almost always dead center on the map. And that makes Texas basically the size of Russia, which only Texans believe is true. Depending on what you've decided to center will skew everything else, even when everything else is already skewed. Our job is to notice that and be able to understand that not everybody is skewing everything in exactly the way that we're skewing things. So equity and inclusion may be other words. Sometimes we hear the word equality instead of equity. So I like to think of these words like shoes because I have a shoe problem. So equality would be that everybody gets exactly the same pair of shoes, which would be great if everybody had size 12 feet and really liked slip on vans because that is the ideal shoe choice for me, then that would be wonderful. But not everybody has size 12 feet. Not everybody likes slip on vans. Some people have needs, right? Some people have different things that they have to wear shoes for. Some people don't like shoes. When we start talking about equity, it's the ability to actually give a pair of shoes and to use this metaphor that actually fit the person's foot and actually fit the person's life, which is gonna involve pesky conversations because you can't just throw size 12 vans at everybody. You actually have to engage with the person and find out what they equitably need or equitably want. Inclusion gets thrown around in a way that I also think is super problematic because it sounds great on the Instagram that we're gonna include everything, everyone, everybody, everywhere, but we often do not have the resources to include everybody, every time, everywhere, for everything. We don't even have enough chairs. So then what the first step of inclusion is to find out who are you not including in this, which may seem a little counterintuitive, but if you only have 40 pairs of shoes, then you can't say that you're going to give shoes to everybody because of the 40 pairs of shoes, you only have 40 pairs of shoes to give away. You got to find feet Cinderella style that fit the 40 pair of shoes that you have. So you need to be able to assess the resources you have and then do the best you can with the resources that you have. That's really what equity and inclusion means. Dominant and subordinated identities. I think this is the last kind of language slide. Within these two words, which sometimes get used and people don't necessarily know what it means, is the very important force of unicorn points. I call them unicorn points because if I call it privilege, some people get very triggered. So when I say unicorn points, that dominant identities are given more unicorn points by some weird social construction that we can talk about in a different webinar. If you do have said chosen dominant identity, then your unicorn points are either taken away from you or just not given to you. And that's what a subordinated identity. Maybe you hear marginalized identity or oppressed identity. What's interesting to me is that these kind of social labels we use to describe different kinds of identities 
whether it is a dominant identity or a subordinated identity, they are related to each other because the unicorn points, I'm using air quotes, that are given or that are taken are in relationship to the other one. So in, we have to be able to understand both of them. And those of us that are super do-gooders, I believe we can use our unicorn points to actually make a big difference. But most of the diversity or social justice work that's happening come from subordinated or marginalized identities because we're just trying to live. So being able to understand how the those two differ, but what's the relationship between the two and the dependence between the two is going to be really helpful. Now, again, when I work with clients, almost none of my clients have actually sat with what are their privileged identities and what are their marginalized or subordinated identities. There are some experts in this room that are very specific subordinated identities. And I'm going to ask us to pay attention to what our dominant identities are. Others of us, we haven't really done this work at all. So I'm going to invite us to do an inventory. I'm going to use myself as an example because that's what you didn't pay money for. And it's kind of a comedy routine. But you are going to do your own inventory on your own paper. And this is not a thing that you have to fax to me later on. This is just notes to yourself. But I want you, when you go through this process, I want you to pay attention to what's easy and what's hard. What comes up for you first, what doesn't come up for you. I also want you to pay attention to what is visible and what is invisible to other people. Because the weird thing about unicorn points is that you don't get to go to the unicorn bank and ask for points. And you don't get to go to the unicorn bank and give away your points. Somebody else is your banker. So whether it's visible or invisible to other people is actually kind of an important thing. So I'm going to use myself as an example. Meanwhile, I want you to multitask and think about your own inventory. Okay. So several people have come in at different times. Some of you probably just brought a watermelon and didn't have anything else to do on a Monday. So can you put an eight in the chat if you are ready to go with a pen and paper and we're going to do an inventory? Let me know if you're available. Eight, blowing up in the chat. Fantastic. Okay, great. So we're going to start with my subordinated identities. You are going to start with your subordinated identities. So for example, and these are the ones that I like created cute little jokes about, right? So I have lots of subordinated identities. These are the ones I've chosen to talk to you about today. So whether it is invisible or visible is going to kind of round out the table. So first off, I identify as a queer person. I don't actually like the word lesbian, but other people use the word lesbian to describe me. So I have to put it in there because it's not always about the words I like for my own identity. That is also a different workshop. And it's relatively visible that I'm some kind of not straight person, largely because I do diversity work. Today, I happen to have short hair and I have whatever kind of social things that are interpreted as like, that's not a straight lady. Okay, great. So I'm a queer person. I put an X under visible. I don't identify as a Christian. That's pretty invisible. So I was raised by atheists. I would say I'm probably agnostic. That's a ag agnostic joke because I think maybe I probably am. That's pretty agnostic. But because I don't wear a hat and because I live in the United States and I know every word of every Christmas song because I go to the grocery store, it is relatively invisible that I actually identify as a non-Christian. So there might be times where I have to actually like come out as a non-Christian because somebody will assume I'm a Christian based on what they see. They have given me unicorn points because of course I'm a Christian. Depending on where I am in the U.S., uh, what's fascinating is whether or not that form of Christian is Catholic or Protestant, that changes based on what part of the country I happen to be in. Um, and I'm none of them, actually. Thanks for asking. But no one asks. They just give me unicorn points. So, okay, great. Next up is uh, phys physical ability issues. I actually have some pretty significant physical limitations and I also am a cranky Gen Xer, so I don't like asking anybody for help. 
So I have designed my entire life to figure out a way that I don't ever have to suggest that we take an elevator instead of a pair of stairs or this bench is lovely. Sit down and stare at this tree sometime. I am the personality to be able to do what I need to do to take care of myself often without having to ask for help, which then makes my physical ability issues invisible to other people. So it's a subordinated identity I have, but it's also one that I cover or I compensate or I accommodate myself because I don't want necessarily other people to know about it. And I get to pick and choose when to make it visible. And then the last one I'm using as a suggestion is that I identify as a woman. That's pretty visible. Although I will say that in my uh, lesbiterian youth days, um, I often got challenged for being in the wrong bathroom because I was wearing mostly masculine clothing. These my feisty, chain-smoking, drinking days. So you're now trapped in a public space with me and I'm about to give you a free TED Talk. It doesn't really happen anymore because I'm like old and fat and I think they just think like that's a woman person. Um, so that's pretty visible. So I want to give you a second. I'm going to take a drink of water to take some note for yourself of what kind of subordinated or marginalized or oppressed identities do you have? And spoiler alert, some of you are like, I don't really know. Maybe I don't have any. And then you'll start feeling really terrible that you don't have any. I feel like the time is coming that like super privileged dominant people will eventually start feeling bad about that. Um, and that's fine. Welcome to the rest of us. Uh, being objectified by your identities impacts most of us. So now you're just welcome aboard. There's plenty of room. But I do want you to notice that when your agency has ever been questioned or taken away because of something somebody else sees about you, whether it is right or not right, is something you're going to think about in this chart and then whether it is visible or invisible. So when you have a couple on your chart, again, you do not have to share any of the information. Just put, let's pick an asterisk. You're going to have to use the shift key and tell me when you're done. Otherwise, I will hydrate. You can always come back to this one too. We have one asterisk. Now they're starting to come in. Okay, good job. For some of you, this is not new work. And for others of you, this might be new work. Great. Okay, so I'm going to flip to dominant identities. So make yourself a new table. We're going to use myself as an example. So I identify as a white person. That is pretty visible. One of the weird things that white people do is that we now talk about how pale we are and we show the inside of our arm as evidence of our close proximity to being a vampire. Um, I'm very white, but I am also very instilled in white culture. Having a conversation the other day about a friend of ours has four grown adult children who are all living in the house. So I was talking about how like white culture, middle class culture it is that like your kids need to launch. Am I questioning her parenting skills? Am I questioning her children's like initiative to go live a life? And I think that's a very white middle class thing, which is probably deeply tied to capitalism because all five kids would need their own toaster, right? Fascinating. I am also a U.S. citizen. That is technically invisible unless I'm walking around with my passport. However, sometimes we give unicorn points away in bulk. And so when you listen to how I use English, because I am a native English speaker, when you listen to how I use English, I am almost always assumed to be a U.S. citizen. There are other places that speak English. There are other people who speak English. But because I am white and I use English the way that I do, I am almost always assumed to be a U.S. citizen. I am a native English speaker. That is a true statement. And because of how you experience how I use this particular language, it is also usually assumed that I have some level of education. My actual education level is invisible. You don't actually know what programs I've been in, but I'm a nerd. I've been to school forever. So I'm highly educated. I am a native English speaker. I am also upper middle class. Like take a second and notice what kind of unicorn points you may have given me because of how I'm using English, maybe because it's my fancy lady sweater that I'm wearing today. 
but chances are you probably assumed some economic class connected to my level of education, connected to my citizenship, which is connected to my race, which is connected to how I use English. Um, that's fascinating. And that's what I mean by like Costco style. We just bulk gave me unicorn points. I am legally married. Um, some people, because on the previous slide, I said I identified as a lesbian. They assume that I'm married to another woman because that's how definitions work. No, I like to keep things as complicated as possible. So I'm actually married to a man and I'm straight people married before gay marriage was legal. If you just crunkled your forehead, I can't do that because I get Botox. But if you just did it, just notice that the crunkling that's happening is you're trying to decide, wait, do I give her unicorn points or do I take them away? I have some questions. Well, number one, I'm in therapy. That's probably going to answer a lot of your questions. And number two, I would say, don't I get to be happy in my marriage and we get to make sense of it first before you need to make sense of it? No, because to decide whether to give you unicorn points or not. Now we're talking about unicorn points and not my actual relationship. So my visibility of marriage is usually because I talk about my partner constantly. And when uh, it's not winter, I can wear my wedding ring. When it's winter, I can't because it falls off because my creepy fingers get skinny. Um, I am almost 50. This is when you fill in the chat with no way, right? So next year, I'm going to have to make this possibly more visible, especially if you ever hear me stand up about a chair. I am obviously not in my 20s anymore. Not a single person has put in the chat that you cannot believe I'm almost 50. I'm very disappointed. Thank you very much. I did invoke shot pat. Okay, so. My age, depending on what category I'm in, sometimes I am perceived as the oldest person in the room and it's actually older than I really am. And sometimes it, I am perceived as a younger person because of who else I'm in the room with, right? So age might be visible or invisible depending on who else you're in the room with. And if you haven't figured it out yet, I'm a flaming extrovert. And um, that's usually pretty visible because even when I'm quiet, I'm talking to someone. So again, I want to give you a chance to do your own kind of dominant identity inventory. If you need to, you can go back to your subordinated identity inventory. Notice what comes up for you immediately. And is it visible or invisible? The last thing I'll say before I have another drink of water is that some people, when they're doing this activity, they're being so literal that they're trying to use my identities to describe themselves. I just want to point out that's creepy. Use your identities to identify yourself. And then you get to guess whether or not it is visible or invisible. Is there some bulk purchase thing happening? Is some of the truth about you misinterpreted or unknown by other people? Okay. And then put a uh, exclamation point when you have a couple on your side. super duper. Because I invoked the term unicorn points, I want to take some time to talk about power and privilege. And I am inviting us to engage in this conversation in a way that hopefully is less defensive for some people. There's a lot of politicalization and baggage, I think, that is connected to these words, which is not lost on me, the irony that there's politicization and baggage connected to the word power and privilege. So if you are multitasking, this is the one screen that I think you should really look at. Because what I love about this picture is you see two people on one side of a gate and you see a whole bunch of other people on the other side of the gate. You don't have to answer it out loud. But what I want you to do is to ask yourself when you first looked at this picture, are the two people opening the gate? Are the two people keeping the gate closed? Metaphorically, we are talking about gatekeeping here around opportunities or access. If most people picture the two people keeping the gate closed, it might be one of those ones you have to push in in order to open it, right? But most people picture the two people keeping the gate closed. And I think what's important about this is that when we talk about power and privilege, Sometimes the words majority or minority get used, and those have a mathematical 
connection. Power and privilege does not have a mathematical connection. So if we take the wealthiest 1% of people who are on the globe, first off, most of them went to the same high school. But of that 1%, there's 99% of the rest of the population. So minority and majority doesn't work within the wealth distribution because there's more people who are not wealthy than there are people who are wealthy. When we start talking about power and privilege, I encourage you to think in a given moment, do you have an opportunity that you are picking and choosing who else has access to it? Or are you waiting? You might be kicking and screaming waiting. You might be going to school or doing training to try to get access. But are you on the other side of the gate to gain access? Or are you on this side of the gate where you get to pick and choose who else has access? If you can think of it in that way, similar to the top of our conversation about responsibility and agency, there is a way of engaging yourself in this conversation that doesn't foster an air of defensiveness. And without the air of defensiveness, you can just talk about what it is you have access to and who it is that doesn't have access to. Often we go straight to money about this, but I want you to think about like, stairs or ramps or when an elevator is broken. I want you to think about when you don't have to think about how you are going to get from point A to point B. When this summer I spoiled myself and I went to Paris, I'd never been to Paris before in my life. Everything I just said right there has a lot of privilege in it because I can travel, I can afford a trip to Paris. I went by myself for shits and giggles and I have a passport. And my lovely little hotel that I was staying in, this little boutique thing with a cute little cafe, um, the elevator broke. And I distinctly remember in tried voice going, I have a room on the sixth floor. I don't want to walk up six flights of stairs. But the difference is, is that I could. And because I think it's not, at least where I have lived in the United States, I got a sheet of paper. I got a present. I got some chocolate. I got an apology. And I was given a timeline of exactly when the elevator was going to be fixed because it was an inconvenience. I thought, wow, well, this is like super customer service. Can I get another chocolate? But it was actually about being able to access the building because it's a historic building and they didn't have the stairwell itself didn't meet certain dimension parameters or whatever. I don't do that. And I, it was such a different response, but my privilege. I didn't even need any of that. I mean, the chocolate was great, but I just was like, oh, I guess I have to walk up six flights of stairs because I have access. So that's how I want you to think about power and privilege. And now that you've done a little bit of an inventory of yourself, you can know how that agency shows up. When does it get taken away from you? When do you have to demand for it? And when do you not even have to think about it? That is what power and privilege is. Now, typically, if we've talked about ourselves enough about power and privilege, our habits get defensive. And so then we start thinking about them, those people out there that are horrible and terrible and way worse than you. If it is helpful, you are correct. Sure, you're right. Great. But what is important to understand is that the people that make us feel right, that's the us group, right? And then those ones over there, those are the wrong ones. So the wrong people are the thems. But this is a little suspension of grammar, but our thems are their us's. And their us's look at us as a them. So this is what we actually need to dismantle because it doesn't make any sense when we create these two different teams. Unless we want to get into how much money very few people are making off of an us and them, but that's probably an advanced class. So let's just agree on this. They are, cussing filter in, donkeys. And they are saying that about us, which makes us all donkeys. So now can we start? Now can we work together? Because it's not about right or wrong or winning or losing. It's just about working with the assumptions that we're making about ourselves and other people. Assuming that we can do that, I have a concept of differently right. Differently right does, is not about moral relativism. It's just about giving somebody a couple of beats to realize that their life taught them, this is how to show up. We have all met people that that is real unfortunate, that their life has taught them that this is appropriate. 
maybe we're talking about like dress code or we're talking about professionalism or we're talking about when someone completely loses it in a parking lot. I have definitely said like, who taught you that this is appropriate? Somebody did. And if I'm trying to engage in a conversation, then I try. Can I do this 100% of the time? No. Can I do it sometimes? Barely. But what I try to do is to afford the person before I get defensive. I try to afford them the opportunity to be differently right. Just for two seconds. Then I can actually change how I'm approaching the conversation. And now we can have a conversation where I'm not defensive. Does this work every time? Absolutely not. Does this work with every person? No. Does this work with every topic? No. But I'm responsible for the topics it doesn't work on, the people it doesn't work on. I need to notice those patterns. When I made the joke earlier about Earth being round, you would be amazed at the number of people who have text messaged me and said, "Um, I'm really confused because they are flat earther people. Okay. Um, Nope, can't do it. You are wrong. You're just wrong. So that's important for me to know that I have that problem. But if you're interested, you can send me text messages to 202-670-4262. You're welcome. I'm going to invite us to possibly with some people occasionally every once in a while. What we see may not be who they actually are. And what they're trying to show us may not be what we see. When we talk about what's visible or what's invisible, you just did an inventory of yourself and allowed there to be some room there for people who do or don't see you the way you actually are. So now can we do it this way? Can we see other people and understand that we might not be accurate about them? That is not a skill that comes natural because I think it's a muscle we have to kind of build up and kind of flex for and be able to build that possibility up. But what we are witnessing and what we see is very much coming from what we are centering in our perspective. Think of that map, right? That doesn't mean what other people are. All we have to do is be conscious that it is possible that somebody is doing something different than we are. So let me use a really controversial example real quick, because that is totally my style. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Western expansion, colonialization, blankets full of syphilis. Anyone? Okay, well, let's go to how the story of Thanksgiving happened. Now, again, this is very U.S. centered. I get that. And that is what I'm centering because that's where I live. So work with me here. I'm going to boil down one of the biggest atrocities that are still actually actually happening. This is not past tense, although we'd like to talk about failed attempts of genocide in past tense. I'll talk about it real quick, but I just want to be able to point out what it means when you are not actually operating with the same information, you're not seeing the same things, okay? So I'm going to guess a boat of dudes showed up and said, take me to your leader. And a bunch of women showed up and they were like, thanks for the welcome squad. I need to talk to your leaders because they're coming from a patriarchal society, even though there was a queen. Um, they're not expecting women to be the leaders. They're expecting men to be the leaders. Well, if I was a smart woman leader, I probably would send a scout and a scout is more likely to be a man person, but they're probably young. So I don't know if the dudes on the boat would see them as a leader. Let's pretend they did. So then they're making a, an agreement, fast forward, lots of horrible things. They're making an agreement with scouts and not the leaders because of how sexism works. So the agreement is to share land. Now, one of these groups does not necessarily understand the word share because you can't own land, because land has its own rights, its own sense of self, its own personality, its own thing that needs to be respected as an entity, not a thing that you're on. So sure, I'll sign this document, but I don't really understand what this word means, but all right, thanks for the blankets. The other side says we're going to share the land. I'm using air quotes. Intention of sharing. They are stealing. They are taking the land, but it's on paper. It's documented. So how long is that, that you have a piece of paper that says that you have been authorized to steal this land? There was no intention whatsoever to ever pay attention to this treaty. 
Now, part of the thing that I want to connect to Crazy Horse Memorial, because I'm obsessed with Crazy Horse, Crazy Horse, actually, <laughs> when Mount Rushmore was built, it was actually, it lost in the Supreme Court. And millions of dollars were given to the Lakota tribe because as an apology for not only stealing land, but carving four white dude faces into a very important mountain face. They were given millions of dollars by the U.S. Supreme Court. The Lakota tribe said, I don't want your money. I would like my land back. Mm, no. So that money has been sitting in a bank account gathering interest and is now worth millions and millions of dollars and not a single of those dollars has been used towards the building of Crazy Horse. I'm so excited. Mary, you can't be just a Crazy Horse shout out. Mary is in charge of development at Crazy Horse Memorial, registered trademark. So what is very exciting to me is that Crazy Horse only uses private donations. It does not use state funding or federal funding. And the whole point of it is to actually be able to build a bridge between indigenous and non-indigenous people. Love this idea. Now I'm using this as an example of a historical disaster waiting to happen because people are not communicating with who they think they're communicating with. They're not using a similar language. There isn't a clear understanding of what is happening and what's going on. And hundreds of years later, we are still in the middle of this miscommunication. I believe it is our responsibility to understand how quickly we assume that everybody is on the same page as us. So when we, I have never seen a stick figure in a bathroom. I don't know if any of you, I certainly never seen a stick figure in a cape, but we have this kind of like universal understanding of who's supposed to be in this space and then expect people in that space to either one, leave me alone and let me do private things, or two, they have the agency to police the space because they feel it's their responsibility. If we could knock that off, and recognize that people are allowed to make these kind of choices on their own with their own sense of agency. And it is not our responsibility. We don't have to police bathrooms. As a woman, I have used men's bathrooms on purpose a lot because the line is usually shorter. I have also accidentally walked into a men's bathroom and been like, oh my God, I'm in the wrong place. It's the same activity, but I am choosing what I'm responsible for and how I'm using my agency. We all do this. And I'm just asking, can we do this possibly a little bit more intentionally? That would be great. So I'm going to take a little pause, see if there's any questions, comments, or thoughts. We have about 15 minutes left and I have 75 billion more slides to go. And the texting number again is 202-670-4262. Emily, thank you very much for saying my sound keeps going in and out. My dog is barking. And Zoom blocks it out, which means it blocks me out, which sounds like it's going to be really helpful because it mutes sound, but I would like it to not mute my sound. But here we are. So thoughts, comments, suggestions, anything? Let me check and see if we have any text messages yet. I don't see any text messages yet, but keep yes, them coming. Yes, this is Regina. And Hi, I, Regina. Hi, Jess. Brilliant. I love this. I taught, uh, I taught U.S. history for decades. and. I, I I love how you can bring this to us in such a um, matter of fact, this is what happened, check it out, still part of our life. Um, and yet it's it's impactful and it's serious and important. And it's just a really brilliant um, storyline you've got there. Well, thank you very much. Your check's in the mail. Um, what I would highly encourage when we specifically are talking about failed attempts at genocide is just notice in your own language, when do you talk about things in past tense? And when do you talk about things in present tense? And do something about that. It's really fascinating, but it's a really good way of doing kind of an assessment of that exact moment. So thank you. I'm not hearing any more and I'm not seeing any text, so I'm going to keep blazing forward. Sound good? I'm giving myself a thumbs up. Great. Um, it's not a diversity training unless we take a Gandhi quote out of context. What I do actually like about this quote, though, is that it's about our responsibility and how our actions stack on top of how we use our agency and our responsibility. 
So notice I haven't really said or tried not to say what is the correct opinion other than the earth is round. And if that's really a deal breaker, you're really going to hate the series. But you're in charge of what you choose to do and what you choose to be responsible for. And that's where you should start. So some of us are familiar with the golden rule. And I'll talk about this a couple of times in this series. But the golden rule is basically, this is when we talk like pirates, right? Is treat others the way you wish to be treated, whatever. Most of us don't even really know how we want to be treated, but we think it's nice enough to treat people the way that I want to be treated. Some of y'all on this call, y'all know me really well, and most people do not want to be treated the way I want to be treated because of I have this caustic personality problem. What's better than treating people the way you want to be treated is to treat people the way they want to be treated, which is the platinum rule, Tony Alessandra's work. But in order to treat people the way they want to be treated, you'd have to engage in a conversation, which most of us don't want to do. But that is your worldview. So I've already outed myself as a native Texan. So now this may be the most controversial part if there are other Texans on the call. But this is my friend, Dan Mitchell, and Dan Mitchell III. And I happened to be there when Dan Mitchell III was born because I was in town. Dan Mitchell II held his son the very first thing he said was i cannot wait to take you to a longhorn game because this is a longhorn family not an aggie family i am a mudblood meaning that my mother was an aggie and my dad was a longhorn it's very controversial in texas it's why i fled the state well one of many reasons i fled the state what is fascinating though is that dan's son graduated valedictorian from texas a&m not the University of Texas. Now, perhaps he's less upset about this because he got a free ride, but I think it's important to understand that if you are this devout of a religious football fan and you can still love your son who became an Aggie, then anything is possible. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to notice which parts of your worldview are important to you and other people don't have to have them and which parts of your worldview are important and other people must have them. You are responsible for that delineation. That is not anybody else's work to do. So no matter where you are or where you came from or how you built, I think it's important to understand that your lived experience, my lived experience has taught me how to be. And where that is a disastrous hot mess problem that I need to deal with, I actually need to understand that your lived experience made you, you. And if I can do that, that's how we quote, give grace. You've heard this, give grace to other people. I don't know who that woman is, but she is exhausted. She's been given away all over the place. What I would encourage give grace means is that people's life taught them how to be and who and how they are choosing to be if they could be responsible for how they are using their agency, it would make me feel a lot better, especially if I don't like how they're being. But can I do that for them? Can I be responsible for my own sense of agency and who and how I got this way? And can I try and be as best as I can and do the best I can some of the time with what I already got? That's pretty much what I stand for. So this evolution is not about language. It's not about vocabulary. In the 1900s, this was called pluralism, at least in my education. Then it was multiculturalism. Then it was tolerance. Then awareness. Then celebration. That got way too loud. So then we started calling it diversity. Then we started calling it social justice. And now equity and inclusion, or depending on where you are, the new words are belonging and justice. I don't care what you call it. Just do it. Please just do it. And doing it isn't that much X outside of you. It's not so much external work as it is understanding that you are the best tool you have to do this work. So let's assume that we are all aware that the house is on fire. Okay, great. All I'm going to ask you to do is every once in a while and occasionally catch yourself when you see a house on fire and you're mowing the lawn. That is not the correct activity. Even if you use a garden hose, you're likely not going to put the house fire out, but it is the correct activity. We are not entitled to any of this getting fixed in our lifetime. 
but it is always the right time to do the right thing. So it's not necessarily about taking a stand or speaking up. It can also be about picking a stand and listening. Then we can actually act in a way that is responsible and based on our agency within our scope of responsibility. Now, I'm all about flying your freak flag. Congratulations, you all probably have one too. But with that freak flag comes a lot of unicorn points that I can do work from my dominant privileged identities with very little risk or cost. That is basically what I'm asking us to do is that believe that we are all doing the best we can with what we have some of the time. Can I do this with every single human being? Absolutely not. But I'm in charge of noticing who I can't do it with. And I'm taking advantage of the people that I can do it with. So noticing is really the first step. Notice when you talk in past tense. Notice which was easy and which was hard when you were naming your subordinated or dominant identities. Notice what it means when a truth about you is visible or a truth about you is invisible and give someone else that same space. Can you do that? That noticing is the starting place of the work and why I start with this particular workshop. It is up to us. Some people like to take a screenshot of this. The font is my actual legit handwriting, which is why I type everything. If we can actually be responsible for ourselves, even a small amount of the time, it's better than never, never doing nothing, nothing. Now, for this particular webinar, I do also, I think Amy, you put in there like, wow, this is so useful and so hard. So yes, I want to encourage you. I am working on a new book. Spoiler alert, it's coming. Um, so this may be the last time I do a book club on this particular book. Good Enough Now is very much about this kind of individual work. So I want to encourage anyone watching the recording or live, you can sign up for the book club before the end of the webinar series, and we're going to go through step by step by step what we're doing. If you have a team of like nine or so, I will come and do a book club specifically for your organization. The idea is I am trying to build an army, sorry for the military reference, of people who are at least self-aware of how they got to be how they are. So sign up before the end of the webinar series. I also should remind you that I am also a keynoter. And if you schedule an appointment with me so we can talk about getting booked as a keynote, you can use Crazy Books as a code and you'll get 10 free books for the keynote. You can use that little fancy QR code. I am very proud of myself for making and I made it my brand colors. That deserves a standing O. Um, but that leads directly to my scheduler and we can set up a time to talk about whatever it is that you have. So with that, I really wanna end on why I'm doing this particular series. I talked a little bit about it in the content of this, uh, this particular webinar, but Crazy Horse Memorial is something that is really, really important to me because it's done right. It's a collaborative building that is probably not gonna get finished in my lifetime or my dog's lifetime, but it is still the right thing to do. So if you're unfamiliar, please look it up. If you are also interested or able, you can make your own donation to the Crazy Horse Memorial. If you have an employer match, I'm self-employed. I cannot do that. Please do use your employer match. But if we can support the Crazy Horse Memorial, then we're actually putting our money where our mouth is and we're starting to build bridges between these different groups that have a lot of history that needs to get fixed. So with that, again, I contact information, the texting number, 202-670-4262. And my social media team has asked me to ask you to follow me on the IG because that's what the kids are doing these days. And by these days, I mean in the last 10 years. And you can do that with this QR code as well. And when you're there, you can download my key studies that I'm working on with my new book. Thoughts, comments, anything else I can help with for today? Otherwise, tomorrow... Join in for what is the first of the webinar series because this was the null set. The first one tomorrow is unconscious bias, perceptions of self and the other. And uh, that's it. End of show. Thoughts, comments, questions, anything else I can help with? Thanks so much, Jess. 
Absolutely. Amy, thank you for your work with Princeton Community Works. It was a lovely keynote the other day. You were it's, it's an absolute amazing speaker for that. And um, I anyway, thank you so much. We'll be in touch. Anyway, but I'll see you tomorrow. Have a great day, Jess, and everybody else. You're welcome. Bye, y'all.